All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about Mendelian genetics. We're going to talk about Punnett squares and this fellow named Mendel. We're going to talk about how traits are inherited and how they are expressed. All right, so let's start with talking about this handsome fellow named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was a monk, an Austrian monk, um, who studied genetics. He was really into science, um, and he had in his monastery access to um, gardens. And so he meticulously studied um, crossing different plants and the, the offspring that he got um, and kept all kinds of notes about it. And we now refer to him as the father of modern genetics. And he shifted us away from thinking what we thought in the 1800s was that um, inheritance was a blending. And, and it's kind of a sensible idea. And I think a lot of people today still think um, that inheritance is a blending. You see somebody who has darker skin and somebody who has lighter skin. They have a child and you see them maybe having medium skin and you think, oh, traits blend. Um, sometimes traits do blend, but most of the time they don't. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. But. Um, if blending were actually the way things worked, let's see if I can move my, oh, I was trying to move, <laughs> I'm a dork, trying to move that out of the way. There we go. And I'm going to hide this. If blending were actually the way things work, then all variations produced would be diluted over the generations. So that is not actually what's happening here. So let's move on. So we have in biology, we have things that are called model organisms. And peas actually are a fabulous organism that Mendel happened to work with. Um, model organisms are organisms that reproduce often. They're super easy to grow. They have a minimal number of um, traits that we can see really clearly. Um, lots of babies, that kind of thing. And peas worked out really well for Mendel. He was able to reproduce them quickly. He could look at whether they had, for example, what color their flowers were what what their peas looked like. Um, and so it was a very um, good organism for him to learn to, um, to study, to learn genetics about. All right. Um, so things that he did um, that were super unique. First of all, he started what are called um, true breeding lines. What that meant is that he mated um, certain plants over and over and over again to make sure that he always got a particular trait. So let's take the trait purple for the flower. And he mated purple flowers with purple flowers with purple flowers with purple flowers. And eventually he ended up always getting 100% of the offspring being purple flowers, um, generation after generation. So he's going down the generations this way. Um, and so those are true breeding lines where they only produce their particular flower color. But then once he gets these true breeding, breeding lines, then he tries crossing one of the, the true breeding purples with a true breeding white, for example. Now, he could have done this with pea pods. Um, he could have done this with how tall the plants were, um, the height of the plants, whatever. There's lots of different ways they could have true breeding. We're just using um, flower color as an example right now. So he combined um, a purple flower with a white flower. Well, how do you combine them? Well, the way that flowers mate is by usually an insect carrying pollen, which is sperm, from one flower over to the inside, it's called the carpal of another flower, and that's where the flower's eggs are located, and then the pollen grows into the eggs, and it fertilizes the eggs, and then you get seeds, which in the case of a pea plant, the seeds are the peas themselves. So he would take a paintbrush, well, first of all, he would take scissors and remove the stamens, which are the part of the plant that produces the pollen, so that it couldn't self-pollinate. And then he'd take a paintbrush and he'd collect pollen um, from the white flower, for example, and then he would paint it on the carpal of the other flower, the other thing he, that he was trying to mate, um, and then he would see what results he got and what were the, the peas. So he got these peas. A couple words I need to introduce, actually, before I go too far. The parental generation, that's the original generation that he originally mates. So he's mating a... a true breeding purple with a true breeding white. There's no such thing as a not true breeding white, but you don't know that yet. Um, then he gets these peas and he plants the peas because they're seeds. Did you know that? And then they grow into plants. And what does he get for babies is the question. And fascinatingly enough, he gets all purple babies again. So the white trait vanishes. Now that um, generation, that next generation, they're called the first 
filial generation, but they're usually just abbreviated F1. So the original parental generation is just called the P generation. And then the, the first offspring that they have are called the F1 generation. So then Mendel did something quite ingenious. He crossed the F1 generation with itself. So he maybe crossed this flower with this flower. So technically those are siblings doesn't matter in the plant world, but he crossed them with each other to get the F2 generation, the second generation. And that's where things started to get interesting. Let's see if I can move on here. There we go. All right. So Mendel's, Mendel's data. For any trait, when two different lines are crossed, the first generation of offspring shows only one of those traits. So the F1 generation in the ones we were just talking about, the ones up here by my picture, um, they were all purple. They only showed one trait. However, the next bullet point, when the F1 generation is crossed, both traits are shown in the F2 generation. So here, let's take a look at his data. And it's always in a three to one ratio. So let's look at this example. He crosses, this is the parental generation, a purple with a white. 100% of their offspring produce purple flowers. So those are the F1 generation. Then he crosses them with each other. So this one with one of its siblings. And then he gets three quarters of the um, flowers are purple, but 25% of the flowers are white. Where did that trait come from? It was missing for a generation. Many of you probably know the answer to that, and that's awesome. We're just kind of reminding you of how this all works. So let's take a look. He studied not just plant color or flower color. He studied how tall flowers were. He studied where the flowers were located, pea, shape and size, colors, all kinds of things. Um, and, and these are the ratios that he got when he crossed those. And notice we're very close to three to one ratio um, almost every time that he does it. Um, why doesn't it land exactly three to one? Because he didn't know anything about crossing over. And so there's some um, variation that he was not expecting. All right, Mendel's conclusions. He determined that there were two alleles. Now that's a somewhat new word to us. So when you have... Um, a chromosome from mom and a chromosome from dad. And let's just talk about in the example that they have in the diagram here, the um, flower color. So the, the allele is a version of a gene. So the gene is for the color of the flower. The allele is purple or white. So the dad's chromosome, it looks like in this diagram, the dad's chromosome has an allele for purple flower color. The mom's chromosome has an allele for white. So those are, they both have the gene for flower color, but the allele is purple for one and white for the other. So and Mendel was like, hey, there's two for every trait. So sexually reproducing organisms have two versions of any gene. One you get from mom and one you get from dad. There are dominant and recessive traits. So when an organism has two different alleles, whoops, trying to get over here. When an organism has two different alleles, we call one dominant and one recessive, one is always going to be expressed over the other. It's like it hides the other. So clearly purple is the dominant trait because it hid the recessive white trait. So the only way that we are ever going to see the white trait is if it is matched with another white allele. So if dad's trait has a white allele and mom's trait has a white allele, we'll see a white flower. But if one of them has a purple allele because purple is dominant, doesn't matter what the other allele has, it's gonna look purple. So let's see if we can um, give you some examples here. So here is a Punnett square where we're combining. Um, these two are pure breeding flowers because they are homozygous. Homozygous means two of the same letters. So two big peas and two little peas. Recessive traits are always homozygous, just to be clear. Um, so we're going to make a Punnett square. So remember that for... Um, the sex cells of any organism, it's going to have half the DNA of the total organism. So this particular purple flower can produce either a big P in one of its, let's say, pollen, or it can produce a big, big P in its other pollen. But it's always going to have, it's always going to donate a big P. The white flower is always going to donate a one, one of the small peas. 
when they come together, you're going to have um, babies that got a big P from one parent and a little P from the other parent. They look purple. 100% of them look purple because they all inherited at least one capital P dominant purple color from the one parent. So now if we take two of these guys, we call them heterozygous. These two were homozygous, same. They had the same two letters. All of the offspring here are heterozygous. They have two different letters. So now when we go to make the sperm or the egg, pollen or the egg for this plant, it's going to have half of its DNA. So it's either going to donate a capital P in some of its pollen or it's gonna donate a lowercase p in the other half of its pollen. So we're gonna put the capital P here and the lowercase p here. Now we're crossing it with a sibling that has the same letters. So here's the sibling that has a capital P and a lowercase p. When we bring them together, we see that three quarters, so three of the four, three of the four boxes have at least one of the dominant trait, which is purple. So that means all three of these look purple. They don't look lavender, we're not blending here. It is possible to blend, but we're not blending now. They look fully purple. The only offspring that we see that are white are the ones that happen to have gotten a white gene, a white allele from one parent and a white allele from the other parent. So it comes out to a three to one ratio and it's very consistent. Um, remind you of a couple words too, phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is what they physically look like. So in this case, purple flowers versus white flowers, that's phenotype. Phenotype, physical look like. Genotype is the letters that they've inherited. So keep in mind that with a dominant trait, with a dominant um, genotype, you can have either homozygous, two of the dominant trait, or you can have heterozygous, a dominant and a recessive. It still looks like the homozygous one because the, the dominant trait hides the recessive trait. So all three of these, no matter what their genotype is, they all look the same shade of purple. The only time that we get a white is when we have two of the recessive traits. Now, this is... This is a little bit complicated because what Mendel was studying was fairly simple. And if I remember correctly, he even ignored some of his data that didn't work out quite right. Um, we are now aware that there are a bajillion exceptions to Mendel's rules, but they're, great found, they're a great foundation for us for learning some of the basics of genetics, and then we'll get more complicated from there. Okay, so let's take a look at Mendel's laws. He comes up with two really important laws, and we kind of touched on them in the meiosis notes. The first law is called the law of segregation. Segregation, if that's complicated for you, think of civil rights and segregation. Um, the word segregation means separation. So in this case, the law of segregation is talking about how alleles can separate from one another. So it says only one allele for a trait goes into a gamete. So you in your body, you have 23 chromosomes from your mom and 23 chromosomes from your dad. The law of segregation says that for a homologous pair, only one of them is going to go into your sperm or your egg. Um, and the other one will go into a different sperm or egg. So they are being separated. The homologous partners are being separated from each other. That's the law of segregation. Let me see if I can continue here. So the segregation of alleles is a random process. The law of segregation is explained by the behavior of chromosomes during metaphase and anaphase of meiosis. Alignment of chromosomes at the metaphase plate is random. So here's the alignment of the chromosomes. Let's see if I can make this come in closer. I'm going to make it as big as I, oh, that was a little too big. Sorry about that. Okay. So in this example, um, if the blue traits are from the father, so we've got um, blue on the bottom, blue on the bottom, and blue on the top here. That's random. It could have been blue on the top, blue on the bottom, blue on the top. It could have been blue on the top, blue on the top, blue on the bottom. Um, so the way in which they line up is, um, is random, and so their separation is random. And that's what the law of segregation says, is that separation or segregation is occurring randomly. So it occurs during both metaphase and anaphase in that case. His other law is called the law of independent assortment. The law of independent assortment says separate alleles for separate traits are passed on independently of each other. That's not 100% true. That is true as long as they're not both located on the same chromosome. If they're both located on the same chromosome, then they stay together. 
But the law of independent assortment is saying that as long as there, he doesn't know what chromosomes are. So when he states this law, he doesn't really know that. This is what I'm telling you. As long as they're found on different chromosomes, then they can be separated from each other and they can be inherited separately. So let's give you an example of um, with the pea plants here. You can have, there's two different things that we are looking at here. Let's see if I can make it work. There we go. So we're looking at um, pea color and we can also look at pea shape. So the color can be yellow, the shape can be round, the color can be green, the shape can be wrinkled. And so he's saying that these are inherited separately. The color gene is inherited separately from the shape gene. And that is true as long as the color gene and the shape gene aren't on the same chromosome because then they're stuck together and you inherit them together. But um, Mendel is saying that they're inherited separately. So that's the law of independent assortment in that circumstance. And we're going to learn more about that as we go. Okay, so let's study this diagram for just a moment. So it says the law of independent assortment is also explained by the behavior of chromosomes during metaphase. Um, during the metaphases and anaphases of meiosis. So let's look at this diagram, sort of study it in detail. Oh, I wanted to see the top and I didn't get to see the top. There we go. So in our P generation, the original parental generation, notice that they will call this the mom. It's in a plant. So it's the one that's donating the eggs. And this is the one that's donating the um, sperm. I mean, the pollen, same difference. Um, so we'll say the mom here. The mom is yellow and has round seeds, true breeding. So she's homozygous for both. The male is green with wrinkle. He is also true breeding. He's homozygous for both. Um, when they produce their egg and their pollen, they come together to produce the F1 generation that has um, inherited both the um, both genes from both um, chromosomes from mom and from dad. They're a combination of the two. Now, next is where we get the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. Remember, segregation is referring to the separation. The two alleles for each gene separate during gene during gamete formation. So this little r is going to separate from this big r, and this little y is going to separate from this big y. That is them separating. That's the law of segregation. The law of independent assortment says that on the what they call the metaphase plate, they can line up either side. So notice that this one is sorted differently than this one was sorted because the male's um, chromosomes are on different sides. So why does that matter? You end up with very different. So for this organism, these are the um, possible offspring or, or sperm or egg that we have. And on this side, these are the possible sperm or egg that we have. So the way that they line up varies in the um, gametes that are produced. And those are called recombinant offspring in that case. All right, so recombinant offspring. Independent assortment can lead to combinations of traits in offspring that are different from the traits in the parents. So take a look at this example here. The parents, if we look at how many, okay, let me go back to where we were. These are their possible babies from the diagram that we were just studying. Um, out of a total of 16 babies, nine of them would be um, yellow and round, three of them would be green and round, three of them would be yellow and wrinkled, and one of them would be um, green and wrinkled. That's the recessive trait. And it always shows up in a nine to three to three to one ratio, by the way. Um, that's something that you'll start to see, um, start to recognize. Okay, but these are the possibilities. Now take a look. This matches the first parent. This one matches the second parent. But these two are different. There was no parent that was yellow and wrinkled, and there was no parent that was green and round. These are called recombinant offspring, um, and that's an example of what recombination is. So, and so we get rid of the blending hypothesis, and don't ask what this wedding picture is about because it's weird. I don't know why the author of this Prezi wanted to do that. All right, so now let's take a look at some Punnett squares, and we probably have gone over in class some Punnett squares, but we'll just review here quickly. Um, Punnett squares might be useful sometimes, not always. Um, their Punnett squares have limited usefulness. Um, they're great for like seventh grade level genetics problems, but then um, we're going to go way past that. So the Punnett square exists to help you visualize the alleles an organism can put in a gamete and the combinations that can result from mating. It's mostly useful for one trait crosses. We call that a monohybrid. So if you're just looking at whether the 
um, the color of the pea plant, the, whether the color of the peas are going to be yellow or green. That's just a simple monohybrid problem. Or whether the pea plant is going to be tall or short. That's a simple monohybrid problem. Or whether the flowers are going to be purple or white. That's a simple monohybrid problem. So the way that it works, let's see if I, I can't remember. So let me just read through this with you quickly and then, then I'll show you how it works. Any monohybrid cross will have four possible genotype combinations. Those are the genotype combinations that are in there. Those are the babies. Those are the offspring that they're going to produce. Different kinds of monohybrid crosses have typical kinds of ratios for offspring. So I told you there's a nine to three to three to one ratio in that other cross. That's very typical. Three to one is very typical. Two to two or, or one to one is is very typical. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that right now. So here's an example. A heterozygote, remember hetero means different, so two different letters, is crossed with a homozygous recessive, so two lowercase letters. Um, individual produces a one-to-one -one ratio always of heterozygote genotype to homozygous genotype and a one-to-one -one ratio of dominant phenotype offspring to recessive phenotype offspring. If you're like, what the heck did she just say? Let's take a look at this diagram right here. So this is um, a heterozygous parent mated with a homozygous recessive parent. So if this is, um, these are the, say the sperm from the one parent, it donates half of its DNA. So it can either donate a little eye or this, the other little eye. That's what can be in its sperm or its pollen. Um, the other parent that's donating the egg, it can donate either a capital I or a lowercase I because it donates half the DNA. So if you've got two genes, it's going to donate one of those genes. So now when they combine, you get 50% or two out of four that are heterozygous and 50% that are homozygous recessive. And so that's that ratio of one to one that they're talking about. Um, and it's always that way. When you have a heterozygous parent and a homozygous recessive parent, it's always that ratio. So that's what they're just showing you on that one. Okay, so let's move on and talk about a dihybrid. Now, the prefix di means two. You could have a dihybrid. You could have a trihybrid. But notice what happens to the size of the Punnett square. It starts to get unruly right away at a dihybrid. A dihybrid is um, a cross between two traits. So for example, the one that we looked at before, um, the color of the seed and the shape of the seed. That's two traits. So if we want to know the one that we were looking at with the nine to three to three to one ratio, if we want to figure out what the ratio would be um, and do a Punnett square, we have to have a Punnett square that has 16 squares in it. And it really is time consuming to do that. So we're going to show you a way to speed it up. So it says um, a two trait dihybrid cross analysis involved keeping track of four genotype combinations for each parent. That'll make sense in a moment. Since these are independent, there are, and this is supposed to say two to the four possible combinations. So 16 possible combinations. Um, so this is annoying. And let's just take a look at it here really quickly so you get the idea. So here's one parent with its two traits. It's got the, the color trait, or I don't know what trait they are, G trait and the I trait. And over here, the other parent has the G trait and the I trait. Each parent is going to donate half of the DNA. So of the four alleles that they possess, they're going to donate two of their alleles, always one of the Gs and always one of the Is. Well, there's a four possible combinations of these Gs and Is. You could either have the big G and the big I, there it is, or you could have the big G and the little I. They Remember, they're um, sorting independently, so we never know which two are going to get inherited. So here's the big G and the little I. Here's a little G and a big I right there, and little G and little I right there. And then this parent also happened, because they're both fully heterozygous, this is the maximum um, possible number of combinations they could have. So this is the sperm, this is the egg. If this sperm um, fertilizes this egg, these are the, this is the baby we're going to get. But if this sperm fertilizes the same egg, these are the babies we're going to get and so forth and so on. And what you end up seeing, um, for example, this one, uh, I guess the, the word they used instead of round and wrinkled, they used inflated um, or constricted. I've always seen round and wrinkled, but inflated and constricted. So this um, plant is going to have green and it's going to be inflated. Um, this plant down here is going to be yellow and constricted, and there are all kinds of ones in between.
So that's an example of a die hybrid problem. Oh, I'm going to back up just a second here. Um, so a tri hybrid would need 64 boxes and a tetra hybrid would need 256 boxes. I guess I didn't need anything more than that. Okay, so now we're going to make probability work for us. Um, because these are independent events, we can just multiply the, the odds of these events occurring. If we want to do something super complicated, we can just multiply the odds times the odds times the odds times the odds without having to make these ridiculously large Punnett squares. So let's look at this down here. So this makes our life a lot easier when dealing with genetics problems. It also means that we can have some pretty complicated genetics problems um, that are fairly easy to write and easy to work out. So it says analyze each trait independently, then combine combine the probabilities. So we're looking here at color and round and wrinkled. They instead of inflated and um, what was the other word? Now they're using round and wrinkled. Okay, so you've got one Punnett square right here. Instead of a four by four Punnett square, we just have two really little um, two by two Punnett squares that are quick and easy to do. So we've got these two. This parent is heterozygous and this parent is heterozygous. And we see that the odds of being yellow are three quarters and the odds of being green are one quarter. Then in this Punnett square, we see the odds of being round is three quarters and the odds of being wrinkled is one quarter. Now, if I want to, let's just make something up so I'm not looking at the bottom. Let's say I want to know what are the odds of producing an offspring that is yellow and wrinkled. I just made that up. So I have to look here. It's three quarters um, for wrinkle or for yellow. So I'm going to do three quarters times and wrinkled is one quarter. So I'm going to do three quarters times one quarter. And you can see that right here, three quarters times one quarter. You multiply across the top and you multiply across the bottom just to remind you how to multiply fractions. So you get three sixteenths. So now I didn't have to fill out that four by four Punnett square to know that three sixteenths of the offspring are going to be yellow wrinkled. All right, and moving on. Oops, didn't do that very well. Moving on. Um, so now here's where you could make like a really complicated um, genetics problem. So if I, this is a tri-hybrid cross. And so if I want to know what are the odds, this is this is the question that they're asking here. Um, what, are the, what are the odds or what is the fraction predicted to have at least two recessive traits? So now we're going to cross all the ones that would produce something that had two recessive traits. Then you add all of them up and you get a total of six out of 16 or three eighths. And so that's where we're talking about how you can get more complicated problems without having to do a tri-hybrid cross that has 64 boxes in it. And we will have a few problems like that where we will practice that. All right, let's see, am I done? There we go. Um, I think I'm just gonna skip this right now. So these are just some example problems and I'm gonna skip them because we'll do those as homework. Oh, and then the last thing we need to talk about, test crosses. So this is if we don't know the genotype, the, the letters of an individual. So here's a purple and a white. When it's recessive, we automatically know it's homozygous. If it were heterozygous, it wouldn't be white. It would be purple. So the recessive organism is always homozygous. However, the dominant organism, we don't know if they're homozygous or heterozygous. I can't look at this purple flower because... Um, two capital P's and a capital P and a lowercase p still produce a purple flower, so I can't look at it and know. So how do I know if it's homo or hetero? I have to do a test cross, and that's what Mendel was really good at doing. So he would mate this one with this one, and he would look at the results. If this was homozygous, then every single time the purple flower is going to donate a capital P, which means all of the offspring would receive a capital P, so 100% of the babies would be purple, and we could deduce, and you're going to need to be able to do this, we could deduce based on the results that that parent was homozygous, um, homozygous dominant. However, if the purple flower has a hidden recessive trait in it, when we made it with a homozygous recessive organism, 50% of them will receive the capital P, but 50% of them will receive a second lowercase p. So when we see the offspring, they will be 50-50, um, 50% dominant and 50% recessive. And so I can figure out then whether the parent was um, homozygous or heterozygous based on the way the offspring look. And I think now we're all done. Is that the last one?
that is the last one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, have a good rest of the evening.